This is Tall Tale TV, your podcast for sci-fi and fantasy short stories. Of Bandits and Bad Magic by Leslie Heron. Chapter 20, Nandina. Eric felt a pang of unease as he stared up at his virtual twin, the true monarch. There was something unsettling about watching him casually converse in slow motion with his own brother, in a different dimension, no less. What were the odds that those two would meet? His gaze flickered over to Varen, who looked lost in thought. Wait, you mean he's not the king? Of course not. Wilfred shook his head as he watched his failure of a once student stride across the hall to squint up at the mirror. If you had bothered to pay attention in aura reading lessons, you would have realized he is completely foreign to our reality. Atlas switched his glance between the two kings, a nervous sweat developing on his brow. Uh, but... He gave the mirror one last wary look before blurting out. What about all the magic? Pulling out a small, tightly wrapped sweet from somewhere inside his robe, Wilfred took a moment to unwrap the tiny candy and pop it in his mouth. That is a good question. He smacked the confection around his cheeks before bearing down on the man as he drew out his monocle once more. Outsiders never display magical talents. He pushed the single eyeglass on his face, giving the other man a once-over. Most species evolve under different conditions. What are you able to do? Eric's thoughts were punctuated by the invasion of his space, and he stumbled back a step, prying his eyes away from his brother. Um, just shadow magic. I can sometimes stop or slow them, but I haven't perfected it yet. He looked around into the comically magnified eye of the wizard and swallowed hard. And I apparently went into shock and plunged the world into a void of darkness? Varen stared up into the mirror at his brother. He looked older now, with several new lines creased beneath his smiling eyes. There was a tightness in his chest as he realized he was jealous at having never seen that look on his face. Wilfred smacked his lips, shaking his head as he did. Typical fear response. Someone told you to try the let it flow technique, didn't they? He pulled away, shoving the monocle back into an inside pocket of his robe. Hippy dippy nonsense. Atlas ran the back of his hand across his forehead, wiping away the building sweat. His mouth felt suddenly parched as he approached his once teacher. What about all the stuff in the alleyway? His gaze flickered over to the false king. That was shade magic. He threw a hand up behind him, gesturing to the mirror. Something he was known for. Oh, they are talking about me. Eric rolled his eyes at the resurfacing voice in his mind. Yeah, uh, some sort of shadow bug attached itself to me a while back, and it did all that, not me. Wilfred nearly choked on the candy as he sucked in a shocked gasp. <coughs> Good gods, boy! Is that a shade eater? He flipped his attention to the arcanist, leveling an accusatory glare at him. Your friend has been walking around with a soul-sucking parasitic revenant, and you never noticed? That was mean. I don't like him anymore. The old headmaster let out a dramatic sigh of discontent. With a bony finger, he began scrawling a sigil in the air. Hold still, and I shall remove it for you. Really don't like him anymore. Don't let him kill me. I'm friend. Wait! Eric tossed up a hand as he took a step back. Leave him alone! He's harmless! Harmless? Wilfred's brows knit together in response. Shade eaters are deceased spirits who refuse to relinquish their identities. 
they can only sustain their existence by consuming the shade or soul of others. It will kill you. Not true. Not true. We have an arrangement. He doesn't take any more than I can regrow, and in return, he protects me. Eric shook his head as he felt Wraith cowering somewhere in his mind. Upon hearing those words, Varen pulled his gaze away from the mirror and exchanged a look with Eric. He felt a pit sink into his stomach. He had heard a similar argument before. Wilfred let out a resigned sigh, dropping his hand and the sigil fizzled out. As I said before, not stupid, just slow. Don't come crying to me when you wake up dead one morning. Although that does explain the shadow magic, you're cross-channeling one another. Evan pulled a face as he nudged the doctor in the shin. I kind of agree with the old crazy dude. That sounds like a really dumb idea, even for you. Eric rolled his eyes with an exasperated wail. Can we get back on track here? Just... Open up a portal so we can haul my brother back through and we'll gladly get out of your hair. The headmaster popped another sweet into his mouth, blinking slowly at the man. What gave you the impression I could do that? Eric's mouth formed a line as he gave a broad gesture to the room they were standing in. Waving his hand dismissively, Wilfred shook his head as he replied, Peering into other worlds is not nearly as difficult as moving between them. He looked up to a large device hanging from the vaulted ceiling in the center of the room. Eric followed his gaze until he spotted a glimmering golden object comprised of a series of nested rings, each one smaller than the next and spinning on their own separate axes. There was a beautiful glow emanating from within that filled him with a sense of awe and wonder. That is the Ophanum. It's like an antenna for, what do you call them? Radios. If you know how to find the right frequencies, you can translate raw data into something understandable. Eric pulled his gaze away from the rotating rings. I've been opening portals for the better part of a year with technology. My device is just broken, he sighed. So you're telling me that with all this magic and knowledge of quantum theory, you can't do the same? Open one? Yes, Wilfred chuckled. But an arcanist trying to do so would be catastrophic. It would be the equivalent of trying to crack open an acorn with a battering ram. It'll get the job done, yes, but you could risk damaging the entire multiverse. Uh, hypothetically, Atlas paused to raise a hand. Well, say an arcanist was attempting to banish a giant plant beast and got interrupted, causing the spell to collapse and form a portal. What would happen? The headmaster narrowed his gaze. Hypothetically, we're lucky you didn't destroy the very fabric of existence. He reached out a hand to bonk his student on the head. Only the life shepherds have the magical know-how to tamper with dimensions and not do any damage. Finally, in answer, Eric cocked a grin. Life shepherds? Atlas could see the light of hope on the false king's face and shook his head, feeling a shiver of dread ripple down his spine. More commonly referred to as the Wicker Witches, they're ancient creatures that reside in the swamps of the Dredgelands. They're old as the planet itself, and not to mention, scary as hell. Wilfred laughed. <laughs> and the only people that will be able to help you... He clapped his hands together. Now that our business is complete, he began shooing at the interlopers. Goodbye. Eric resisted the old man's attempts to shuffle them from the room. Wait, I have so many questions. Of course you do. Wilfred shoved against them, pushing the last of them through the open door. I just don't care. Eric threw out his hands, grabbing onto the frame. 
There's so much I need to know. Wilfred took a step back, rolling his eyes as he did. Fine. With a snap of his bony fingers, a small book appeared in his hands. He pushed it against the other man's chest, causing him to relinquish his hold on the door to catch it. There. Try not to die. He turned his attention away. As for you, Master Atlas, this was pleasant. We should do it again, say, in another decade or two. Eric had barely a moment to register the book when the headmaster slammed the door in their faces, leaving them alone in the hallway. Evan sighed as he pushed his hands on his hips. If we're going to a swamp, one of you is going to have to carry me. Eric turned, ready to ask the Arcanist to help them navigate the endless halls in order to leave, when he realized they were already standing back in the dusty foyer. Wait, what? He looked around. How did we get back here? Atlas shifted uncomfortably. Duh, well, they don't call it the Infinite Tower for nothing. The hallways change all the time, and the Headmaster has a modicum of control over it. But, listen. Eric shrugged and shoved the book into his bag. Well, saves us a trip. Let's get out of here. Atlas held up a hand, pushing against the other man's attempts to leave. Oh, I need to tell you something. But you have to understand, I thought you were the actual king. And, well, circumstances being what they are... Okay, I don't like the sound of this. Atlas pulled his hand away and began to pace. I didn't want to, but uh, I had no choice. And Barry... What about Barry? Evan stepped forward. <sighs> the bounty hunters. Atlas stopped pacing, turning to give them a pleading look. They have him. Before the others could even ask, he gestured meekly towards the massive wooden door. They're just outside... I was supposed to take you in while they set up the ambush. He hung his head in defeat. They caught up to the two of us just a day out of the city, and... Eric sighed, closing his eyes as he pinched the bridge of his nose. Okay, how many? A dozen, at least. Right outside the door? Atlas took a step forward. I'm sorry, I didn't want to. They forced... Eric held up a hand. Look, I get it. Barry's your family. I would have done the same thing. He moved his fingers down along his chin. The fact that you told us says a lot. We can discuss it later. Now, we just have to figure out a plan. He looked down at the tiny Merc. Evan, you and Varen go back and... He paused looking around. Wait, where's Varen? Oh, I saw him leave the gallery after you refused to get rid of your shade eater. Atlas glanced around. He should be somewhere out here. Evan's shoulders fell as he noticed a single set of footprints in the dust, heading away from them and towards the main door. Oh no... You think that mage can be trusted? Dimitri took a long swig of his ale before slamming the tinker down on the tree stump, glaring at his lackey. He knows we got his bear. He won't be backstabbing us. He let out a loud, rumbling belch before reaching over to grab a fistful of the prince's hair, pulling him in. Otherwise, we might just have to tell the regent lord his baby half-brother is up for ransom. Varen winced at the tug on his hair, averting his gaze. Lucian would be loath to pay a ransom for him. The only reason his eldest brother hadn't killed his siblings sooner was that it would have caused questions about the royal line. Even though Lucian wasn't allowed to govern the country as a king, he was all too happy to do so as regent. The peace treaty their father had brokered with the other nations meant full-blooded elves could not be rulers, only those of partial human descent. And, with Elias gone, 
Varen's death would mean the royal line would be broken, and the council would have to convene to declare a new king, one with human lineage. Varen sighed as he looked back at the tower, swallowing hard. He noticed as a hushed silence fell across the camp. The bounty hunter stood still, listening. He could hear it too, the rumbling sound of a mechanical lock and the low creak of a wooden door. A large, unwashed human stood, dropping his tankard. It's the king! Dimitri let go of the prince and climbed to his feet. The mage had done his job. Walking confidently ahead of his undead minion, the king led the mismatched trio from the tower. He let out a hungry growl as he turned back to his camp. Be wary, men. I smell a trap. He snatched the prince up by his hair and dragged him along behind. Varen stumbled, wincing against the pain. He struggled in vain against the bindings on his wrists. Shame burned in his chest. Because he left to get some distance, his friends were now as good as captured, and the regent lord was sure to find creative punishments for them all. Atlas and Evan exchanged a single knowing nod and broke away from the others, fleeing into the forest in opposite directions. Eric threw his hands up in exasperation. Seriously? Cowards? The unwashed human turned to his leader. Shall we send some men after them? Dimitri grinned and shook his thick head. No, the king here is the real payday. Besides, Atlas will be back. We still have his pet. He made a point to kick the large creature as they walked past. It was muzzled, chained, and weak from being beaten and half-starved for the better part of a month. Eric ground his teeth as he watched the ogre of a man climb the hill, parting the dead brush in his wake. He hoped the bounty hunter was too focused on his prize to go after the others. The plan was to flank the camp and spook the hunters out with some magic, rescuing Varen and Barry without so much as a fist fight. But looking at the group of outlaws and ruffians, he was having some doubts. He folded his arms and forced a stoic look on his face as he watched the man come to a stop twenty feet from him. Dimitri pulled the prince closer, throwing him onto his knees in front of him. He withdrew a dagger from his vest and placed the blade's edge against a baron's throat, a wicked grin curling his features. If you don't want your brother harmed, your majesty, I suggest you come with us, quietly and without any magics. There was a long, rasping moan as Bob shuffled forward. It turned into a growl, like that of a hungry dog, as flecks of purple sparked to life in his milky, wide eyes. Let's have some fun. I want to play. Dimitri's hand slipped, and he felt his blade graze across the prince's neck. He pulled the knife away, brandishing it towards the king. Oi, no funny business. Call off your beast, or I'll... A scream cut across the conversation, followed by the unmistakable sound of marching feet. Soldiers, clad in crimson armor, burst through the tree line stabbing at random at the retreating bounty hunters that were too slow to step aside. From the shadow of the forest, a large black warhorse marched towards them. The rider brandished a flag bearing the regent lord's symbol. Unhand the prince, ruffian, or I shall ensure you are dismembered piece by piece before I take your head. The soldier approached, sliding off the back of the majestic steed. He pulled off his helmet to reveal a scarred and battle-hardened face. His salt-and-pepper beard matched the tangle of hair that spilled around his shoulders, but he was well-groomed and clean-spoken. I am Cahal, commander of the Royal Guard. Your kind has no place here. Dimitri shoved Varen back towards his men 
and leveled his knife at the pompous do-gooder. Piss off, mate. I was here first, and I'm gonna collect the bounty on the king. Cahal looked down his nose in Eric's direction. I see no king. He is only a common criminal, one that kidnapped the prince. Eric had hoped that the arrival of crimson armored soldiers meant they would be saved, but the commander's tone made it plain that they hadn't arrived to the rescue. But if they could at the very least occupy the bounty hunters... In the distance, the eerie call of a battle horn rang out, drawing everyone's attention to the tree line. Dimitri spat. Calling for backup already? Cahal glared at him. What trickery is this? A tremendous roar exploded from the forest, and for a moment, Eric thought that Atlas had rescued Barry. But another call of a war horn sounded, closer this time. Rasizi burst out of the shadows on the back of her giant hellhound, charging in their direction with an enormous two-handed cleaver poised for the kill. Grunch followed behind, knocking trees aside like scrub grass, urged on by his tiny red master. He guffawed as he swung a massive, severed metal I-beam in one hand like a child. Leaping off the back of her hellhound, Rasizi landed in front of the other two leaders and brandished her weapon. The king is mine. If you do not wish to meet your makers, flee. Or make peace with your death. Eric winced. Perhaps causing such a scene with the priests, and then letting the word spread like a beacon to his location, had not been the best course of action. Cahal barely reacted, only moving enough to draw the blade from his scabbard. Disgusting orc! How dare you sully my presence with your filth! Not to be outdone, Dimitri tossed his tiny dagger from hand to hand. Piss off to both of ya! I was here first. Chaos erupted into a free-for-all brawl. Bounty hunters, soldiers, and twisted all bit, tore, and cleaved at one another. Grunch bounced up and down, smashing enemies and allies alike as the ground trembled with every landing and the three leaders continued to scream at the other two as to who should leave first. Ashamed to admit that he was all too interested to see how this event would play out, Eric realized that now would be the best time for him to slip away into the bedlam unfolding around him. He jumped when he felt a hand grab his arm and turned to see one of the bounty hunters about to shiv him with a rusty knife. Bob howled in rage and picked the man up with both hands, lifting him above his head. Eric watched with an odd sense of pity as the undead creature charged into the fray, launching the bounty hunter towards an armored soldier. At the edge of the forest, Evan peered out from behind a bush. The plan had been to spook out some witless bounty hunters— not jump into the middle of three fighting factions. He bit down on his resolve and caught sight of a familiar fur cloak. Varen was being shoved to the ground next to Barry. He looked up at the arcanist with a nod of his head. The two bounded in, bewildering those left to defend the camp. Evan ducked between legs, slashing at anything he could reach as Atlas followed behind, less than acrobatic. His hands were at his sides, and he let his rage fuel his magic. Chaotic winds howled through the camp, ripping tents and flinging debris as he sent bodies of stunned bounty hunters deeper into the woods. Barry let out a frightened whine as the two approached. Rasizi spat on the ground before burying her tusks in a victorious grin. It sounds to me like your soldiers and backup have been decimated. You cannot win, wench. We have the might of the Brotherhood behind us and the power of an entire kingdom. I ain't come all this way to leave empty-handed. Eric sighed. 
The only thing missing from this pissing contest was Father Alistair and his warrior monks. But the thought of the bleeding, decapitated body sent a shiver of revulsion down his spine, and he felt the urge to witness the outcome leave him. Perhaps it was time to leave, he thought. Yes, too many to fight and win. But maybe kill one or two on the way out? <sighs> Let's just get out of this in one piece, okay? In the midst of the chaos, Eric found his presence went relatively unnoticed. He was nearly clear of the worst of it when an orc broke free from the battle and charged straight towards him, a wicked cleaver raised above his head. Eric took a step back. Get ready, Wraith. He had only begun to feel the cold chill of his Shade Eater's energy as it licked its way up his legs when a halberd soared through the air and impaled the orc in the neck. The momentum of the weapon flung the creature's corpse to the ground in a shower of blood. Fighting back the overwhelming urge to retch, Eric looked for the source of the attack. A soldier, taller than any he had seen, broke ranks and strolled towards him. Face hidden by a crimson helmet, the armored figure yanked their weapon free as they continued to approach, closing the distance between them. Any time now, Wraith. Eric couldn't hide the panic in his squeaky voice. Be patient. It's bright out. Easier to do in the dark. Backpedaling, Eric glanced around wildly for Bob. The undead was still lost somewhere in the chaos. He turned back in time to see the soldier reaching a hand towards his chest. Wraith? Okay, ready now. Eric lashed out, slapping the hand away. The soldier spun, but didn't fall. They regained their footing with an odd sort of pirouette, and before he could even formulate what to do next, they were towering over him, glaring down at him behind a crimson visage. Okay, now what? Eric scanned his brain and landed on an image of the way his brother would wind up his punches. He reeled back a fist and let it loose with all of Wraith's enhanced power. The soldier simply stepped to the side and tapped the king on the back of the head. The momentum of his punch, combined with the extra help, carried him off balance. Before Eric could even hit the ground, an armored forearm wrapped around his torso and hauled him up into the air. Eric writhed, pushing himself away from his captor. At this distance, Wraith's power was condensed into an overwhelming force, and that strength sent the soldier crashing to the ground, dropping both him and their weapon. Eric pushed himself to his hands and knees, spitting out the mouthful of dead weeds. Wraith, we need to take care of this now, before you run out of energy. He grit his teeth around the sensation that forced him to his feet. He looked down at the shadowy mist as it tugged at his limbs and gave over control to his mental roommate. Wraith used Eric's body to dash forward, snapping up the discarded halberd. An efficient weapon, constructed for war. It was a cross between a spear and an axe, extremely versatile and requiring no real expertise to use effectively. He brought it around in a wide arc, cleaving straight for the soldier's middle. The armored figure stepped forward into the attack, dropping beneath it at the last second and sliding on the dirt as the weapon cut through the air overhead. They shifted their weight to pivot on one foot, bringing their other leg around in a tight sweep. Eric had no chance to react before he found himself disconnected from the planet. His back slammed into the earth, the air rushing from his lungs. Lights popped in his vision as he stared up at blue sky, the remainder of Wraith's power fizzling out on impact. The Crimson Soldier ripped their halberd back with one hand and used the other to snatch up the king's ankle. Despite the weight of hauling an unwilling body, the warrior practically sprinted for the tree line, Eric wheezing and kicking as he slid painfully across the dirt. That is, until something large and angry barreled into them. As his senses returned, 
Eric lifted his head a little, still prone on the ground. He saw Barry peel back his lips and let out a tremendous roar. He slammed a massive paw down onto the soldier's chest and pinned them in place. Atlas was standing on the bear's back, purple balls of flame flickering in each hand. That's my friend you're kidnapping. The soldier let out a bark of laughter as they grasped the bear's paw with both hands and twisted. The sudden jerking motion elicited a yelp of pain, and the beast collapsed to one side, sending the mage tumbling into the decaying field. The spell broke, and fire exploded outward, lighting the dry grass ablaze. Eric's mouth dropped as the crimson soldier stood and gripped him by the shirt, hauling him into the air. How? Now I don't feel bad for losing. As they disappeared into the tree line, Eric glanced back to see the battlefield in utter chaos. Fire was spreading quickly across the dry grass. Through the smoke, he could see the three leaders still in the midst of their standoff. He couldn't hope to determine who was winning, but Grunch was holding Dimitri in one hand and reeling back his metal I-beam with the other. So, at least the bounty hunters would not be among the victors. The Crimson Soldier slowed to a jog as something small jumped into the path ahead of them. Evan sneered at them. Drop him, or I'll cut you down until you have to look up to see me. He flipped the knives around in his hands, a grin spreading from ear to ear. The soldier stopped, tilting their head curiously. Eric had to marvel at the little merc's tenacity. It never ceased to amaze how someone south of two feet tall had the conviction to challenge a seven-foot monster. Varin lunged forward from his hiding place, sword drawn, the soldier reacted instantly, grabbing his blade with an armored hand and ripping it free. But the attack had never been intended to land. Evan welcomed the distraction and jumped in, sinking a knife between the joints of the armor at the back of their leg. The soldier dropped to one knee, pinching the blade between the metal joints before it could pierce deep enough to do any damage. They swept their halberd down, swatting at the little man. Evan danced around the clunky weapon, cackling as he snatched back up his knife, placing himself in front of the doctor. He spun the blades in his hands once more. Come at me! The prince jumped in, swinging a fist towards the armored figure, which caused them to dodge and take another step back. As they leveled their halberd in his direction, ready to charge... A gust of wind slammed into them and forced them backwards a half dozen steps, but they never lost their balance. Atlas ran up, placing himself in the line between the false king and the crimson soldier. A slightly singed berry hobbled up to join him. If you want him, you'll have to go through all of us. The soldier huffed and began stalking forward again, switching their grip on their weapon they barely even took note as a flaming undead creature stepped out of the brush but came to an abrupt halt when it let out a rattling howl and purple began to seep around the edges of its eyes. Bob moved to the very front of the line, eagerly awaiting orders. Enough! In that moment of hushed silence that teetered on the edge of chaos, the crimson soldier dropped to one knee, bowing their head in obedience. Eric turned towards the source of the command to see a young, sulky woman step out of the shadow of the trees. She rushed up to the soldier, placing her hand on their shoulder. She wore finely embroidered traveling clothes in deep shades of crimson, expensive and ornate, yet practical enough to traverse the forest on foot. Her brilliant amber eyes shone like gemstones against her dark, vitiligo-dappled skin, and her blonde hair was pulled back into an intricate braid tied up in a bun at the back of her head. The woman scanned the group until her eyes locked onto Eric's. 
her breath caught in her throat as her hand moved to clutch her chest. My king! Evan looked up at the prince, a question tugging at his brow. Who the heck is this? She didn't wait for approval and rushed forward, pushing past the others until she was able to throw her hands around her lost love and pulled him down into a passionate kiss. Varen sighed and looked down at his tiny mentor, signing the words, The Queen. Of Bandits and Bad Magic is book three of the ongoing series by Leslie Heron. Tune in every few weeks to hear the latest chapter as it's being written. If you'd like to listen to books one and two, you can find links in the description. Ah, stupid boy. Never listen to anything. How he's still alive, I have no idea. Wait, where's my cheese? Why, that little sneak thief. Try and steal from me, will you, miscreant? If I could expel him again, I would. <laughs> I warned him what would happen. He can't have gotten too far. Let's see him steal from me with jellyfish for... I suppose it's only a bit of cheese. <laughs> <laughs>